Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 289 for Monday, March 13th, 2017. Scott Hanselman. This episode of Triangulation is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. When it comes to the big decision of choosing a mortgage lender, work with one who has your best interest in mind. Use Rocket Mortgage for a transparent, trustworthy home loan process that's completely online at quickenloans.com slash triangulation. And by ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 200 plus job boards, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. Welcome to Triangulation. This is the show where we talk to some of the smartest people working in the world of tech today. I am Megan Maroney, and my guest today is Scott Hanselman, who is a programmer, a coder, a blogger. He is <laughs> he has lots of toys. Uh, he's an advocate. He's a husband. He's a dad. I'm not going to put those in any order. Uh, they're, they're in the order uh, that he wants them to be, which is part of what we're going to talk about, how he does all these things. Welcome to the show, Scott. Hello. <laughs> I think my auto focus there. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I am okay. I'm a little uh, a little washed out here. It's very snowy outside, so it's very, very, very icy and bright. So sorry about my white balance on my camera here. Well, it's just it's just you shining through. <laughs> I don't know. I, if I get any whiter, I'm going to be clear. Do you want to fix it before we start? Nah. Okay. I'll, what I, what I, you want, actually, you know what I'll do? And we'll okay. keep it on the show. Okay. As we do is we open up the window, freak out the camera, and then close the window really fast. And oh, nothing happens. No, you don't, I think you're a little <laughs> bit lighter. I mean, darker. <laughs> More human yeah, looking. it's going to take a lot of time in the sun to pull that off. <laughs> we'll see. Well, we've talked on Tech News today a few times, but I wanted to have you on Triangulation to really go into depth because you have such a variety of interests and activities that you do. So I just want to talk a little bit about you. So what, how did you get your start in coding? Was, was computer science something you always imagined you'd be doing? No. Uh, actually, it's 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 weird that I'm uh, I'm on two shows in a row to talk about stuff like this. I was on Joel Spolsky's uh, Stack Overflow podcast a couple of days ago, and he his folks asked me a similar question, and uh, autofocus is bothering me. And uh, <clears throat> he says, uh, so I told him basically what happened was when I was in fifth grade, um, there was a computer uh, in the in the school, and I was trouble causing trouble. The joke around the school was that I was voted most likely to be convicted of a white collar crime. It's just doing all kinds of stuff. You know, I wasn't a gangster. I was more like a gangster with paperwork. Uh, and uh, there was a meeting about getting me, you know, under control and what is he good at? And my fifth grade teacher had said, well, he's always on the Apple II. What can we do about that? And it seems like this was the time when you could have meetings about kids and get the superintendent involved and make big decisions. So the principal and the superintendent of schools uh, met with my fifth grade teacher and they made a deal where I could take the Apple II on Friday nights. They could basically, I would steal it because it wasn't officially allowed to be doing this because it's a $2,500 computer. My dad backed his pickup truck up to the school and we stole the computer. And as long as we had it back by five o'clock on Sunday, that it was okay. And then rather than running around uh, kind of causing trouble all weekend, I messed around with this Apple II. And uh, this is, that is when life kind of cleft in half, if that makes sense, you know? There's there's before that and after that. And in some parallel universe, there's a, a Scott that took a right turn and headed in a different direction. Had my fifth grade teacher not given me that computer I don't know what I would be doing. I uh, could be anything. You might have also invented mobile computing too, because it seems like backing up a truck and <laughs> getting a computer. It was it was it was a luggable at best. But what was interesting about it was that this was a teacher who wasn't afraid to give a kid a level of trust. You know, even they put the fear in me about the thing, and I was always afraid I was going to mess it up. But they were they were very 
they took a big risk to give me that very, very expensive computer, and I would not have had access to that. So then, again, this is like Apple II, peak, Apple IIe maybe, peak of the Apple uh, times in the 80s, early 80s. And then uh, after that proved to be successful, my dad actually sold our van and bought a Commodore 64, which was like $200 or $250 at the time, which was a huge amount of money. And, uh, and then that kind of began the process. And then it was just a matter of keeping me inside or keeping me outside. So my mom made this deal where for every hour inside, I had to be outside for an hour. <laughs> so they would, I'd be on the computer for an hour and then they'd kick me out and I'd sit on the porch and then read computer books and then they'd let me back in. <laughs> That's a great rule. <laughs> it is. It keeps you balanced. Of course, given the white balance of my camera, you'd never tell that I got that much sun as a child. <laughs> but in fact, I did. <laughs> So you are uh, you're at Microsoft now. What was your path to Microsoft? Where uh, where did you start? Where were you immediately before Microsoft? Immediately before Microsoft, walking backwards, I went. I worked at a place called Carillion, where I was the chief architect. Carillion sounds a lot like Corellian, which was the system that Han Solo is from, and all of his spaceships and stuff. You know, the uh, Millennium Falcon was a Corellian freighter. Uh, Carillion was named after that. Uh, they changed the name so George Lucas wouldn't sue them. Uh, and they did retail online banking. So I worked on a lot of uh, banking systems, like just big big banks that you've heard of before the uh, the U.S. Uh, banking industry collapsed, which was not my fault. <laughs> before that, I was a trainer. Uh, before that, I worked at a place called Chrome Data. Uh, at some point, I worked at uh, Best Buy and did all the kind of stuff. And at some point, I made tacos, you know. Uh, it's 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 a process, but I've been I've been working since I was about fourteen and working full time doing computers for money since right out of high school. Uh, and then when I got out of high school, uh, I visited some colleges that I didn't have enough money to go to, uh, and instead ended up going to Portland Community College uh, because that year, the year that I got out of high school, they had started a, com a computer software engineering course to compete with the computer science courses. So it was practical, hands-on, with very little theory as opposed to the computer science stuff. Uh, and that kind of like started the software engineering path, which turned into internships, which eventually turned into a series of jobs and then 25 years in tech. So now you're the principal program manager at Microsoft. What are your responsibilities there? So with, with respect, I would say I am a principal <laughs> program manager, one of a cast of thousands. Uh, principal at Microsoft World is a rank. This is a little bit of a segue. There's always a Microsoft person on a show, and then someone will say, oh, well, you're the senior whatever, or you're the principal whatever. Those are just the ranks. So there's like PM1, PM2, senior principal, partner, super rich, famous, you know, distinguished, whatever. You know, it's like, it's like uh, you know, ranks of weapons in Skyrim. Uh, so, you know, I'm squarely middle management. Uh, what I focus on is uh, .NET, open source, and ASP.NET. So I manage a community team, and we work for a gentleman named Scott Hunter, who eventually rolls up to a woman named Julia, who owns all of Visual Studio. So the, the easiest short answer is uh, I manage community for .NET and, in some ways, the larger Microsoft developer community. And I've got a remote team. I live in Portland, so you're looking at Portland right here. Uh, and my, my, I have a team. I've got a, a gentleman in Ireland, and I've got a young lady in uh, in uh, New York, and I've got a person in uh, in Philly, so people people all over. And then we manage community, make sure that we're doing the right thing, making the right products. And then occasionally I give presentations, but giving presentations isn't really my job. And you also blog on the side. Uh, your your blog is your own, your own uh, thoughts. It's, it's not just about programming. Uh, it's about life and uh, productivity. Hmm? And, and you're one of the few bloggers who I feel like really are still doing it, uh, still seeing it as an important medium. Uh, what, why do you, especially uh, in your fields, feel like blogging is still important? I am not a huge fan of the walled garden. Uh, I think that Facebook is a walled garden. Uh, you know, I really, really dislike websites like Quora, where, you know, they like, here's the, here's the answer. No, I'm going to cover that with a div and make you log in first because, you know, you can't, you can peek through the wall, but you have to, you know, sign up to get in. Um, so with blogs, you own the domain, you own the software, you own the back end, you own, you know, you own the, uh, you own the content, you own your words. 
So uh, while some people have maybe noticed me putting things on like Medium recently, that's cross-posted with my blog. And then I use a, a special Google thing called rel equals canonical that says the canonical URL is over there. And that way, cross-posting doesn't cost me any kind of Google juice. So it all flows from my blog. Uh, if I do anything on Twitter that I think is interesting, I'll bring it over to my blog and make a blog post about it. You know, I want to bring it all to my my location. And I may just end up being at some point, you know, me and a nil dash and a couple other people will be the old people on blogs, while everyone off runs well, everyone else runs off to startups and stuff. But you know, Medium got bought and App.net shut down. And, you know, I don't think Walled Gardens can survive. So Angel Fire and GeoCities and, and on and, you know, and on and on and on. They're all gone now. And all your words that you wrote on those sites is gone. So own your own domain. That's why I, that's why I do that. That's really good advice. That was a long and rambly thing. <laughs> I apologize for that whole answer. No, absolutely. So do you think uh, part, I, I mean, I I guess I think this isn't really a question. I think part of the success of your blog is not just not just about programming. It's really showing that programmers are are more than just their work. Uh, they have mm. families, they have lives. And your some of your pieces, some of your pieces really struck me. There's one that you talk about perspective. Uh, it was a post called Software and saving babies. And you write, the majority of us, we're not saving babies. We're not writing Mars Rover code. We're making insurance systems, shopping carts, the next Facebook or Uber. How do you stay inspired, even if, you know, what you're working on might change and it might, it might not be about, at the end of the day, about saving babies? Yeah, for me, it's about what you could potentially do. Okay, let's, let's, let's juxtapose two questions here. First, the saving babies concept is that when you need to take a break and spend time with people, take a break and spend time with people. You know what I'm saying? Like there's this sense of like, you know, you need to be on the, uh, the death march, you know, the 60 hour a week death march. And uh, you got to be in work. Your boss says you got to be in work. I mean, yeah, you have to work to pay the rent, but is your software saving babies? If it's not, I think you could take a break, take a half an hour, go for a walk, breathe the air, call your family, pick your kids up at school, you know, try to just, the point is about perspective. Um, but of course, if your software is saving babies, by all means, save the babies. <laughs> your family does not matter. Um, but, the, you know, the, the point is perspective. The the the, the, the second point there about, um, about being well-rounded and staying staying inspired. For me, it's not about what I'm going to potentially build, although these are all fun things that I build. Uh, it's also about what we could potentially enable people to build. So I feel like, like, you can see I have a lot of Lego back here, right? I feel like if you can build a new Lego brick, then you can go and give it to a young person or a new person who's learning how to code, and they're going to plug that brick into other bricks in a way that no one ever thought about. And that's that's where the fun is. So the inspiration for me isn't the building stuff. It is the enabling other people to build stuff. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And actually, speaking of building really cool stuff, can I show you something really quick? Is Please. that okay? Am I allowed? <laughs> yes. Um, so I work uh, peripherally on an open source project called Night Scout because I'm a type, type 1 diabetic. I'm diabetic. I have an insulin pump and a bunch of equipment and tubes running through me and all kinds of stuff. And they recently hooked up Alexa. Check this out. Ask uh, Alexa... Ask Night Scout what my blood sugar is. Sorry, I can't find the answer to the question. Oh, you suck, Alexa. <laughs> Alexa, ask Night Scout what my blood sugar is. 114 and holding as of six minutes ago. Your temp basal of zero units per hour will end in six minutes and you have 1.00 units of insulin on board. How cool is that? That is impressive. Would not have had that idea. You know, but if you give someone a really cool SDK and you give them a tool like Alexa and then they already have a thing, of, yeah, Alexa needs to shut up now. Every time I mention her name, she's like, me, what? Hmm? <laughs> yeah, so the Night Scout project is this great open source DIY project where you can go and manage your blood sugar online. And I've got all these systems that feed into that. And once I can do that, yeah, there's a whole chart right there on how to put your, your continuous glucose meter or your CGM in the cloud. Each one of those boxes is a potentially interesting, you know, Lego brick. So what we've seen is 
programmers and non-programmers alike get inspired because they're like, wait a second, my blood sugar is in the cloud. I'm going to put it on a watch. I'm going to put it on a smart tablet. I'm going to put it on the wall on a picture frame. You know, I'm going to go to Goodwill, buy an old picture frame, and then write a Raspberry Pi thing that makes a PNG that puts it somewhere that sticks it on the frame so then I can see my kid's blood sugar. That That's where things get, get fun. Exactly. I mean, it really points to, you know, we all have specific needs and, you know, we, we, our complaints about software are, you know, it's never perfect. It's never exactly what I want. But what you're saying is make it what you want. Yeah. And that's where the importance of STEM or STEAM education comes in is that if, the, if, if a child or a young person or even, uh, you know, you and I doesn't feel enabled and empowered to make such things, then that's just going to give you a sense of powerlessness. You know, uh, this is the whole argument of teach people how to change their own oil in the car, teach people how to drive a manual stick, because you could live 50 years and you're driving an automatic and someone else works on your car and then something breaks and you have no idea what to do. Uh, or we've all had the time when our parent explained to us how to, you know, flip the fuse in the fuse box. But I've met people and gone to their houses and flipped the fuse in the fuse box. And there's a light that goes on when they go. What the, like there's a whole world of fuses out there that are popping, and I had no idea. Uh, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like there's a layer of abstraction underneath everything, and when you have an understanding of that, that's power. And when you don't, that's helplessness. And so I know I know you've been involved in marches for makers. I know you've did, but been involved in some of the Microsoft programs, uh, Hour of Code, that, that sort of thing in the past. What are some other projects that you've done uh, in that effort to to make the powerless field powerful? Well, we should showcase Marches for Makers. Uh, that's something that Saran Yitbarak from Code Newbie uh, and I came up with where we're going to spend, we, we've done this two years in a row, so this year will be the third year in a row. We spend the entire month of March using our podcasts, our blogs, our Twitter, as well as Google Hangouts, uh, trying to get people excited about making stuff. This was a great one right here, Raspberry Pi 3 unboxing. This just happened where a Raspberry Pi 3 showed up in the mail because I'd ordered it, and I sat down with Saran, uh, and I said, we should do an unboxing. And she was like, yeah, that's so cool. So she and I jump on Hangouts, totally unprepared, and we start unboxing and we spend an hour look there's younger me um we spend an hour messing around with the thing with no plans trying to get an led to blink and then at the very end about three or yes look we're googling for stuff three four five minutes from the end we end up getting the light to blink and she just like puts her arm and she says yeah we did it like there you go see we're plugging things in we're debugging together and it's just the joy of of that we got an LED to blink. Now what can we make? That was just so cool. So we try to spend March doing that. And we're we're looking for sponsors. If you're a hardware company and you're interested, it'll be Marches for Makers brought to you by Megan. Could happen. Could be your opportunity to get famous. You could get on the internet. This episode of Triangulation is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Now, getting a house is exciting, it's fun. Where am I gonna put my smart TV? Where am I gonna, am I gonna use a smart lock or a dumb lock? It's very exciting. Uh, smart couches, smart everything, that's what I say. You know what I need to be smarter? The mortgage process. When it comes to the big decision of choosing a mortgage lender, it's important to work with someone who you can trust and who you know has your best interest in mind. With Rocket Mortgage, you'll get a transparent online process that gives you the confidence to make an informed decision. You no longer have to waste all that time searching through your stacks of paperwork. With Rocket Mortgage, you can securely share your financial information to get a mortgage approval in just minutes. You can even adjust the rate and the length of your loan in real time and make sure that you get the mortgage solution that's right for you. You don't want it to be right for anyone else. You want it to be right for you. Whether you're looking to buy a home or refinance your existing mortgage, you can lift the burden of getting a home loan with Rocket Mortgage. Skip the bank, skip the waiting, go completely online at quickenloans.com slash triangulation. That's quickenloans.com slash triangulation. Make sure you add the triangulation at the end there so they know that we sent you there. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage for their support of triangulation. Well, I am talking to Scott Hanselman, who is a principal program manager at Microsoft. He is a teacher, a coder, a father, a speaker, an inspirer. And uh, we are talking about his work inside and uh, outside of 
programming. So at, at Microsoft, you also do the Virtual Academy, which uh, t yeah. tell us what that is and, and what is what what it's designed for. So Microsoft Virtual Academy, um, actually, click maybe later, uh, is a. Uh, is an online academy. There you go. So this is an online free academy where we can go and teach people all kinds of Microsoft technologies. It's totally, totally free. So if you go to the very beginning of this video here, uh, in this one, this is an introduction to ASP.NET. And what we do is I sit down with, uh, there you go, there's Maria on my team. Maria lives in New York and she works with universities, colleges, uh, code schools, uh, technical schools, um, trade schools to teach them .NET. So you know, we said, let's go on to the Microsoft Virtual Academy where they teach stuff like SharePoint, but let's teach .NET and ASP.NET 101, like really basic, like let's, in, let's start from a bare computer and install it. So in this video, uh, Maria walks me through getting started with C Sharp. You know, it's the kind of stuff, there you go, hello world. You don't really see that kind of content uh, too much on Microsoft sites, it's usually much more advanced. So we've ended up doing three, uh, three one day shows. So there's basically three full days of content. There's beginner, intermediate, and then what we call cross-platform day. Because one of the reasons that I came to Microsoft is that it doesn't need to be necessarily all about Windows. Uh, so cross-platform day, we only use Macs and you know Ubuntu and Docker and things like that. Try to change the face of, uh, of Microsoft. <laughs> So let's talk also about Hansel Minutes. That's your podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, why did you start it? When did you start it? And who is it for? So the, the, the idea of a Hansel Minute uh, was a teasing that a friend of mine named Travis Illig came up with. Uh, Travis said, when I used to give really bad, um, I used to give really bad estimates. And he would say, well, is that a regular minute or a Hansel Minute? <laughs> Because I would say it'd be done in 20 minutes, right? Uh, and so, so he, someone said, there's a lot of podcasts out there that are basically just two dudes on Skype and people go on for hours, right? You know, you've, you've all, we've all listened to those podcasts <laughs> with, with all due respect to those people who know who they are. <laughs> you know, it's like the morning zoo of, of podcasts, you know, you know, and we're back on the morning zoo, you know, and the next thing you know, they're number three on, on iTunes podcasts but I'm not bitter. Um, <laughs> so thinking about Hansel Minutes and trying to maximize one's time, I thought about a theoretical person who is just trying to keep up, trying to go to their job at, you know, Aflac or wherever, and they got a nine to five and they drive to work or they bus to work or they train to work and they come back and there's wasted time there. There's 30 minutes of wasted commute. What if I could put together a show that wasn't two dudes on Skype, but that was interesting people talking about interesting tech that you haven't worked on, right? You maybe have a corporate job or maybe you're working on just Java or only Ruby. What if I gave you a show that was everything else but that and uh, people you've never heard of that you've never seen that you've never met that you maybe would never pump, bump into and then tighten it up, no chatter, 30 minutes tight and do it every Thursday. And I've done it every Thursday for the last 550, 53 Thursdays. And I, as I said on, uh, when I was talking to Joel Spolsky last week, I have finally gotten to the point after 500 plus shows that I am now officially proud of this show. You click on archives up there at the top uh, and just like, just scroll down right there at the top archives, scroll down just a bit and just, just drink in all these freaking cool people from all over the world talking about the cool stuff that they're making. There's startup people, there's VCs, there's comic book artists, there's the you know, CTO of NASA, the CEO of iFixit, JavaScript experts and functional programmers and educate. I mean, this just goes on and you're only you're only 50 in. You know what I mean? Uh, this is a re yeah, it goes on forever. So this is a really great, you can just stop now. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> this is a really good show. Now the first 300 maybe were a little rough, but the last 200 were rock solid. <laughs> so I am I am exceedingly proud of that show and those people. And one of the other cool things is that I tend to catch people right before they become famous. You know what I mean? Like if enough people go on enough shows, eventually you're like, oh, that person became famous and that person became famous. Uh, so like Kimberly Bryant from Black Girls Code, you know, was just getting started when he had her on the show. 
Uh, and now she's got a global phenomenon. You know, my show had nothing to do with it, but I feel like I caught her at the beginning of the of the uh, the bell curve. Okay, so we've talked about your podcast. We've talked about your work at Microsoft, your blogs. You do a lot. You are also a speaker. How do you do it all? <laughs> <laughs> I'll sleep when I'm dead. <laughs> uh, balance and scheduling and a patient and a patient wife, uh, but also trying to be efficient when one sleeps. Uh, you know, it's really easy to sleep. 10 hours or 12 hours rather than eight. It's really easy to, um, it's really easy to plop down on the couch and burn three hours really easily. Um, it's really easy to waste time when one could be using multitasking in a feasible way. So like, I really like TV, but I really need to work out. So I built a treadmill desk so that I can work out on a proper full size treadmill and watch TV. And then you make a deal with yourself that says I will only watch TV when I am moving. Right. So then, you know, if I watch three hours of TV, I don't have to feel guilty about it because I was walking for three hours and that's like nine miles. That's true. So you've also written that you said you need to draw the line when things get stressful and decide what's important and yeah. choose those things first. H yeah. How do you decide what's important? So there's like what you need to know, what would be nice if you knew. And then there's like trivia. So like if you told me that I had to go and learn, you know, Python. That could take me from a very calm place where I am right now and then throw me into just confusion and like a stress, like, oh my God, my hand says I have to learn Python. Oh, that's too much. It's such a big topic. Who am I gonna what am I gonna do? Well, wait a second. You didn't say learn the whole of Python. You did you want me to just know what I need to know? Maybe can I learn that in a week? Can I do that in a month? Uh, could I become somewhat competent? You know, the 80 20 rule, right? How quickly can I ramp up? And then at some point, you just draw a line and you say, listen, I've never claimed that I was going to be a Python expert, but I will be a competent Python hobbyist or I will be a junior Python engineer, right? You know, I have no illusions that if I went to work at a new company tomorrow and they said learn Python, that I would become a senior Python engineer instantly. So you have to draw the line at what is the right amount of information to know and whether you're going to be a Swiss Army knife. You know, kind of a sad little knife that can do lots of things. Uh, or whether you're going to be like, you know, some kind of ninja blade that is completely specialized. And uh, I prefer to be a little bit more, a little bit more flexible. So I tend to draw the line pretty aggressively between need to know, should know, ought to know, trivia. I prefer to be a ninja blade that folds up into a Swiss army knife. Is that possible? That would be, that would be amazing. We should put that on, on Indiegogo or something immediately. <laughs> Uh, I was watching one of your productivity videos from a few years ago, your talks, and you talk about the Pomodoro technique, which I think I practice halfway. It's, you know, you do something for 25 minutes. And that's really what I, I mean, I, you know, set timers on my smartwatch for 25 minutes. Can you talk a little bit about, do you still use it? And I've got how my it works? Pomodoro, I've got my Pomodoro around here somewhere. I don't know my tomato. I think it's in that closet right there. Uh, a Pomodoro, Pomodoro is Italian for tomato and uh, the, the, the little Pomodoro is a little plastic egg timer, but any timer will do. And there's a million different apps that'll do Pomodoro. The idea is that a Pomodoro, a Pomodoro is a unit of measurement where that unit is 25 minutes. It's 25 minutes because you need five minutes to pee. So uh, this, this talk that we're having would be a two Pomodoro talk. Uh, the idea is that you're supposed to put your head down and sprint on one thing for as long as you can, or in the case of a Pomodoro, 25 minutes without focusing on other things. So for example, if you and I are working on something for 25 minutes straight without any interruptions at all, there are going to be interruptions. There's going to be external interruptions like my phone beeping, and then now, now I've just wasted time and there's context switching, right? That's an external interruption. And then an internal interruption is like, I've got to go to my doctor's appointment. And now I've interrupted myself. Those things removed us from our flow. So the point with Pomodoro is to be conscious of both internal and external interruptions and to remain in your flow and do whatever it takes to stay in that flow. Okay. If you have something happen, external interruption, just have a little notepad next to you. Here's mine. And then you write down, I just got interrupted. Just a little tick. And then at the end of it, you look at your, your text and you go, wow, I interrupted myself 12 times and I was interrupted by external things three times. 
what can I do to make the next Pomodoro, the next unit of time cleaner? Well, I can put my phone on airplane mode. I can put do not disturb on my door like I have right now. I actually have an on-air light outside so the kids know not to come in. Um, that solves that problem. And then I do another Pomodoro and then I write down whether or not it worked. And then I explore that. So it's about mindfulness around interruptions. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think I just, uh, I need to, to be more mindful about my interruptions. I've got the timer down exactly right. <laughs> the mindfulness. And speaking of taking breaks, we have to take a break right now to thank one of our sponsors. This episode of Triangulation is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. If you have ever tried to hire someone, you know it's hard. You want to find the right person. It's very important. And you don't know where to look and you don't have time to look because you're already short staffed because you're looking for someone to fill that job. So you, uh, you want to make this easier on yourself. And I, I can show you how. Uh, you can use ZipRecruiter. It is a really great way to post your job in one place and then it gets spread everywhere. It goes to all the places it needs to be. And finally, your job posting will be seen by that perfect hire uh, that you couldn't find before. With ZipRecruiter, you can post your job to 200 plus job sites. That includes social media networks like Facebook and Twitter. And you can do all this with just one single click. You can find candidates in any city or industry nationwide. You just post once, don't waste your time. Then you can spend your time watching all the candidates roll into ZipRecruiter's easy to use interface. You don't have to juggle all those emails anymore, answer a bunch of calls. You can quickly screen the candidates, you can rate them, and then you can hire the right person fast. So find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by Fortune 100 companies and thousands of small and medium-sized businesses. So right now, you can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. Don't forget the twit. We want them to know that we sent you there. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. One more time to try for free. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. And we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of triangulation. And I am talking to Scott Hanselman. Scott is a programmer, he's a coder, he's a teacher, he's a productivity expert, because you have to be a productivity expert to do all the things that he does. Uh, you can follow him on Twitter at Hanselman.com. So I want to talk about, you have some blog posts about imposter syndrome. Uh, let's talk a little bit uh, about that and how, uh, how you got involved in thinking about it and, and mentoring people about it. Mm. You know, when you're just starting, when you're just learning how to run, when you're a kid and maybe you're, you know, a tween or 9, 10, 11, and you're running downhill and you're running, 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 and your feet are slapping, slapping, slapping on the ground. And then you think about your feet and then you fall, <laughs> yes. right? So then you figure, okay, I just need to run and try not to think about my feet and then they'll do their thing. Our careers are a lot like that. And I worry that if I get caught up in the thinking about my feet, that I'm going to stumble. And imposter syndrome is a lot of like that. You realize that you're maybe I'm going a little too fast. You know, like maybe this is going to be a problem. I, I really have no business running down this hill as fast as I'm running. And then you think about your feet and you fall. Um, so I think that we all have imposter syndrome a little bit because we get we get into situations we've never been into, Right. How do you get experience without a job? How do you get a job without experience? Um, we've all been in those jobs when you're just slightly in over your head and you're probably going to get in trouble. So I would propose that we can put together safe spaces for everyone where they can express that, you know, uh, I am I am not alone. I am probably in over my head on this thing, but give me a couple of months and I'll be okay. Uh, I've been very fortunate to have a boss that's very supportive about me doing dumb stuff. And he told me straight up when we got started, and actually my friend Chris Sells came up with this idea and told me about it, that if you're not getting in trouble at work twice a week, no, was it twice a week or twice a year? I think it was twice a year, but I may be getting in trouble too often. That's a separate <laughs> conversation. He said, if you're not getting in trouble at least twice a year or twice a review period, then you're probably not pushing hard enough. And then when he told me that, it was like, oh, wait a second. So my job isn't to try not to get into trouble, it's to try to get into the right trouble, try to do my job so well that maybe I overstepped or I overreached or I maybe assumed something. Um, but I did it out of passion, you know, for the job. So uh, all of those things kind of come together to create safe spaces for people who feel that they may be in over their head. 
And the other thing was to use my, you know, niche but some somewhat large little niche uh, following to express to people that you are not alone because the number one thing about imposter syndrome uh, is that people think that they are the only one that feels that way. And to express that maybe someone that uh, is, is, is bigger than you think, you know, a big deal or whatever, or, you know, tiny famous – uh, may also feel that way. I don't know if you've ever had this problem or maybe you know someone who's had this problem, but it never goes away and you just deal with it. Yeah, no, I definitely feel like I have that problem. It also comes sometimes from being in a in a job where uh, you're surrounded by people who are different than you, um, which mm-hmm. uh, having uh, worked in tech tech media for the last yep. 15 years, that's something I'm often the the only woman in the room. And that, that mm-hmm. helps to add to like, I, I'm different than everyone. I must not be as good as everyone. But I mean, I have a super supportive team here. So I don't, you know, that a lot of that is internal, not external. But, but here's the important thing to, this is again, you notice that mindfulness is now playing a role in that last two conversations. It's the exact same thing with Pomodoro. It's one thing to feel like that. And, and you just kind of said it was internal. And then one could then go to the next step. Like, well, and I just kind of like, I swallow that deep down and it just is my inner pain. Or let's just do the exact opposite of that and just rip it out and say, let's talk about this. Like, this is a problem. And in the instance of being the only person in the room, you need to say, I am the only person in this room and I'm going to own that and I'm going to be okay with that. Now, it's difficult though. And here's the challenge. Not everyone has that built in sense of privilege, right? Like I'm speaking from a straight white guy's perspective where it's like, well, I am absolutely supposed to be here, you know? Uh, And uh, I needed to get that, like when I went to Microsoft the first time, there was a sense of like, well, this is where adults, like adult, I I can't, I can't adult with all these adults at this adult place. Uh, You know, uh, everyone has these varying levels of not belong, not having a sense of belonging. What we can do, uh, you as someone who's been in the industry for uh, some years, and what I can do in the same context is lend our privilege to other people and help them help them feel better about their place and let them know that they aren't alone. What are some ways to to lend our privilege? That sounds like something I want to do. Yeah, you know what you need to have on the show is uh, lending privilege is a concept that was came up by a friend of mine named Ann Juan Simmons, A-N-J-U-A-N. Ann Juan is a brilliant speaker on uh, inclusivity, and he uh, came up with this idea of there are varying levels of privilege that people have, whether it be male privilege or uh, seniority or age or race or whatever. And when you, there he is, amazing speaker. You can find his talks and his, his speaking up on, on the top there. And he gave this talk on all the different things you can do to lift voices up, right? So like if you go back to my podcast, all those different people are not on the podcast talking about, for example, uh, diversity and technology. Because 500 episodes of diversity and technology would be really tiring. But they are all talking about amazing stuff that they are building from their perspective while being, whether it be you know, men or women or whatever in, in technology, they're talking about it from their perspective. So there's 500 episodes there of cool people building cool stuff. I have a small audience, therefore I lend my privilege to those people and give them that voice just as you are lending me yours right now and putting me on uh, a legitimate show. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. So part of this show is it's called Triangulation because it's a, it can be a conversation between our chat room that is watching live and you and I, and there's been a discussion in our chat room about- Uh Uh-oh, there's a chat room? (laughs) No, imposter the, syndrome is, is, is like firing right now. It is a very kind chat room. But there's been a discussion about focus versus multitasking because you were talking about uh, being on the treadmill and watching TV and also focusing mm-hmm. on the text tasks. So can you separate that a little bit uh, uh, about what the difference between being able to multitask? Uh, you know, what you're, you're saying is you, you know, you have this, you're, you have diabetes and you mm-hmm. are still doing all of these other things at the same time, creating, making, coding uh, and... Uh, also, just you're talking about focusing on one thing. So can you tease that apart yeah. a little bit? That is a freaking awesome question. Uh, so there is there is necessary multitasking, like driving and you know talking to your spouse in the car. Uh, there is feasible multitasking where you know it is it is a reasonable thing to do, like watching Game of Thrones and walking on a treadmill. let's let's look at that. That's totally reasonable. And then there's completely infeasible multitasking, like texting and driving. 
right? Where you just really not need to not be doing that. Or brain surgery and, you know, making a trade on E-Trade. You know what I mean? Uh, so if you can uh, put those into a strata, for example, I am multitasking right now, not trying to be rude, but my blood sugar is on this system right here. So I am watching. Let's see if I can get this to hang on. Here it is. So I'm watching my blood sugar on this chart and making sure that I don't die uh, in the middle of our talk. That can sometimes be looked upon, of course, as rude because it's like, why does he keep looking at his phone? Right? What's that so rude? He's on a TV show. Uh, but in that case, that's necessary multitasking. Um, it might be feasible that I could have a conversation with you and you know check my email, but that's really not really feasible, right? And uh, I can I can try walking and checking email. Uh, but it depends on whether or not my brain works that way and whether or not the email is really important. Uh, if it's something that's a you know, basic email, I could do that. If it's not, I might just stop the treadmill or jump to the side and put my, you know, straddle the treadmill. Um, if it's deep, intense coding, you know, I am introspective and I know that when I use my seated desk, my standing desk, my treadmill desk, what works for me. So I try to chop up the work in places where, you know, the, the, you know, the soldering and treadmill desk is not feasible. Does that make sense? It does, yes. Yes, don't ask me why I know that that's a bad idea. It's, just, <laughs> it's best, that we, best that we never speak of that again. Well, I, another question from the chat room. Friendly in Oklahoma wants to know if you fixed your Xbox controller. I did, actually. I fixed several of them. That's funny. Thank you. It's so kind. So I, I on my Instagram, um, I was last night, I was watching TV with the wife, and I noticed that the X button on one of them didn't work and the RB button on another one worked and the joystick on the other one worked. So I was watching TV with my wife last night. It wasn't actually one Xbox controller, it was three. So I took apart three Xbox controllers and found varying levels of three of things wrong with them. Uh, one of them was uh, had orange juice. Yeah, that one there had orange juice on the buttons. I have no idea where that came from. Very likely <laughs> one of my sons. Uh, one of them had a broken piece of plastic inside it. And uh, and then the other one uh, had a bad uh, solder trace. So yeah, I was just messing around. I'm also right now working on fixing this this baby camera. This is an old baby cam. So I'm, I'm re taking it apart and I'm working on making it uh, something I can put outside and uh, spy on my neighbors uh, or uh, have a security network throughout the house. <laughs> I got a bunch of crap over here, actually. This is my desk of desk of crap. I've got my... Let's see, that is just so washed out. I apologize. I've got a 3D printed uh, Game Boy that we're working on. Uh, batteries need to be changed and varying and sundry electronics things. Well, Scott, uh, it's been lovely to talk to you. I know you have to be on your way uh, to an appointment. I have so much more that I that I wanted to talk about. You have written books. Uh, you have a book about relationship hacks, being married to a normal, a geek being married to a normal. Let's talk about that for a second. Okay. That is my... Big failure. That book has been 40% done for like three years. And I just don't know why I can't finish that book. So my wife and I were working on this book called Relationship Hacks, and we put it up on, on, on Lean Pub, which is this great website that lets you basically use Markdown and compile it into PDF. But then life happened, right? You know, my wife got a job as a, as a nurse and uh, I am, you know, I'm just, for some reason, this book, I'm going to have to take like time off work and bang this book out because my friend Lovey, uh, L-U-V-V-I-E, just wrote an amazing book called I'm Judging You. And uh, she uh, is now New York Times bestselling author and she's flying all over the world and she's epic and amazing. And the way that she did that is that she stopped hanging out and she started getting stuff done. You know what I mean? Like she would stop answering texts and stuff like, why is Lovey ignoring us? She's working. You see, and 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 that's the thing. I, I enjoy this, right? I enjoy the I, it's such an amazing book. I recommend this to everyone. So Lovey disappeared and then wrote this book. And what she's great about, and she's at lovey.com. Lovey, what's great? Lovey's great about it is she disappears, recharges, and then she comes back in this like I'm back. So she unapologetically leaves, though. And this is something that I'm really working on. I took some time off in December for a, um, a surgery, a shoulder surgery that I'm actually going to an appointment for right now. And 
I was still connected though. You know what I mean? Like here was my opportunity. I took a month off work. I could have been off Twitter. I could have been writing that book, but I was still connected. And I, I struggle with that still. And I, I look to people that I look up to like, like Lovey who just disappears, puts her head down and then sprints, which kind of gets back to the whole conversation about sprinting, about priorities, uh, and about, um, focus. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's something that I, I, I think I do okay at, but then I see people are really achieving and I say, you know, I'm going to be a little more like lovey or I'm going to be more like Anwan or I'm going to be more like Megan and focus on the thing that is important to me. And, uh, and, and I'm, I haven't gotten it right yet, but I'm going to keep trying. Well, if you stop responding to my emails, I'll know why, and I'll be glad. <laughs> You'll know exactly why. Well, go to Hanselman.com. You can see all of Scott's speeches and his talks and his work and uh, follow him on Twitter. He is uh, great over there too. So thank you so much for coming on to the show, Scott. Absolutely my pleasure. Thank you so much for, for letting me talk for all this time. <laughs> I feel I feel bad. Like we should have talked about you. No, no. <laughs> Next time, I'll come on your show and talk about me. There you go. <laughs> All right, take care. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for Triangulation. Triangulation records every Monday-ish. Uh, you can find all the episodes at twit.tv slash try, and you can subscribe to the show there. And uh, we love your suggestions. You can tweet at me. I'm at Megan Maroney if you have a guest idea. And uh, yeah, just uh, Leo will be here on the show next week. And we look forward to talking to more interesting people in tech. This is Triangulation. Triangulation.